hope that if the lights go out while I'm preaching, that it's not God's way of just basically letting you all get ready to take a nap and now he's turning off the lights. That might be a message that he might be sending me. Open up your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Now, a question that is asked from time to time, it's a good question, is what, what's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Now, we know that the Old Testament is Genesis through Malachi. The New Testament is Matthew through Revelation. The um, New Testament focuses on Jesus and the church. And the Old Testament focuses on Israel and the law of Moses. But uh, what really is the difference between the two of them? Well, you'd have to have a whole series of lessons that you know we could go for a couple of months on all the differences that are between the Old and the New Testament. But for this, for this morning's lesson, I'd like for us to look at Jeremiah chapter 31 because Jeremiah is preaching this about 600 years before Jesus was born. And one of the things that he's going to bring out in this chapter is that God, even during the days of the Old Testament, God had al always planned for the Old Testament to be replaced with the New Testament. And in prophesying this, he gives some differences between the two. So you're in Jeremiah chapter 31. I'd like for you to look at verse 31, starting with verse 31 of Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So you have this prophecy, 600 years before the beginning of the church, 600 years before the birth and the life and the death and the resurrection of Christ, that God is going to make a new covenant with Israel. And it's not going to be like the covenant that he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt and took them to Mount Sinai and gave them the Ten Commandments. It's going to be something very different. And he lists two of the differences right then and there. No longer will people be saying to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. And I will write my laws upon their hearts. So we're going to examine what exactly that means. If you go over to Hebrews chapter 8. Now the book of Hebrews was written about 20, 25 years or so, maybe 30 years after the church began. So the book of Hebrews is written again around 600 years after Jeremiah wrote his book. And if you go to chapter 8 of Hebrews, and you look starting at verse 6, Jesus uh, is talked about here. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 8 verse 6, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, and then keep reading. Does that look familiar? See what he's doing here, starting in verse 8 and going all the way to verse 12. He quotes what we just read from Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. He quotes it verbatim. And then look at verse 13. 
He says, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and, and growing old is ready to vanish away. The theme of Hebrews is basically the writer is inspired by God to write to Christians who were of Hebrew Jewish ethnicity during the first century AD, during the early days of the church. And if you read the book of Acts, you'll see that, the, that all Christians who were Jews, who had converted to Christ out of Judaism, they were being persecuted heavily by their Jewish brethren. They were, uh, you remember Saul of Tarsus before he was converted and became the Apostle Paul. He was going from door to door and dragging Jewish disciples of Jesus out of their houses, throwing them in prison, killing them. He was there when uh, Stephen was murdered. Well, that was happening to a lot of Jewish Christians in the first century. And so when you are facing this much persecution, it is very easy for Satan to tempt you, hey, you know what, you, this is just too much. Why don't you just give up on this Christianity thing and just go back to Judaism. You, they'll stop uh, taking your property away from you, as Hebrews chapter 10 brings out that they did. They'll stop killing you. They'll stop throwing you in prison. You won't be losing your job, your livelihood anymore. Why don't you go ahead and do that? And so Hebrews is written with the goal of showing these people persecuted Jewish Christians that Jesus is better than Judaism, that the New Testament is better than the Old Testament. And what he is doing in chapter 8, he is bringing out that the Old Covenant, the Old Testament that God made with the nation of Israel at Sinai when Moses gave them the Ten Commandments, that that has been taken out of the way. It happened when Jesus died on the cross. And Jesus, when he died on the cross, he established his will, his last will and testament, the New Testament, the New Covenant, which is now in place here. And when he is bringing out to them, when he quotes Jeremiah, this was always God's plan. Even during the days of the Old Testament, God prophesied that the New Testament would be, would be taking its place. So, what are some of the differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament? We'll look at what Hebrews and Jeremiah bring out here. He says that, number one, verse 9 of Hebrews 8, it's not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. You read Old Testament history, you will see time and time again that the nation of Israel as a whole continually fell away from God. And when they did, God would allow their enemies, the, nation, the pagan nations around them, to conquer them. And so when Hebrews brings out that they did not keep my covenant and so I showed no concern for them, that's God's way of saying they did not keep my covenant and so therefore I punished them by, being, by allowing their enemies to conquer them. That's what Old Testament history brings up. But then he says, this is the new covenant that I am going to establish with them. Notice verse 10 of Hebrews 8. He says, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I was reading this past week, and this will not, for those of you who know me well, this will not surprise any of you. But I was reading this past week a biography of Abraham Lincoln. And one of the things that was brought out in the biography was that Lincoln, even though he, he never did officially become a member of any church, he read the Bible and reread the Bible and reread the Bible over and over again all throughout his life. And the author of the biography brought this out about Lincoln, that because he kept reading the Bible over and over again, it got to where in his adult life, in his speeches, in debates that he had, in conversations that he had, he would be able from memory to just bring out passages of the Bible and, that were relevant to what he was talking about. 
He did in his second inaugural address, the With Malice Towards None with Charity for All speech. He did it with many other, on many other occasions as well. And when I read that, um, I, I was reading it on my Kindle, and so I highlighted it and I shared it on Facebook uh, yesterday because one of the things that was apparent to me is that the only reason he knew the Bible so well that it was in his mind that he knew it, he was able to quote it from memory when the, when the occasion called for it, was because, as the author brought out, he kept reading it over and over again. From Genesis through Revelation, he read it over and over again. That's how he came to, knew it, to know it. And that's by knowing it, that's how he came to use it. Do you remember when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness? Why don't you go ahead and turn these stones into bread, Jesus? Or, you know what, Jesus? Yeah, you know what would really get people to follow you is if you performed a miracle. Just throw yourself off the temple because it says in Psalms, his angels will catch you, you know. And you know what, Jesus? If you, I, I can make it easy for you. Everyone will, all the kingdoms of the, of the world will be yours. All, you don't have to go to the cross or anything. Just fall down and worship me. You know, being the son of God, Jesus did have the power and the ability to miraculously and supernaturally banish Satan from his presence right then and there. Being deity, being God, Jesus could have summoned lightning bolts from heaven to strike Satan. But he didn't do it, did he? How did he defeat Satan when Satan tempted him? He kept saying, it is written. It is written. You should not put the Lord your God to the test. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of the mouth of God. You shall worship the Lord God only, and him only shall you serve. He kept quoting the Bible. And it's no coincidence that in Luke's account, when you read the, uh, what scant information you have about Jesus' childhood, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. It brings out that his parents had taught him the will of God. In Jewish culture back then, their education system was built entirely around the Old Testament. The Old Testament was their textbook for just about every class that they had. And they came to know the Old Testament because they kept listening to it and they kept reading it over and over and over. So they knew it. Even those of them who were illiterate knew it because they kept listening to it over and over again. And that's the environment that Jesus grew up in and that's the reason why Jesus could say to Satan, it is written. And Satan quotes the Bible to him. And Jesus says, ah, but it's also written here. He knew his Bible. What did God say about the new covenant? I will write my laws on their hearts. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. Now, Christians, he's talking about us because we are under this new covenant. So here's my question for you. Has God actually written his laws in your mind, on your mind, and on your heart? How well do you know your Bible? Abraham Lincoln was not a Christian as the New Testament defined it. But he knew his Bible. He knew his Bible very well because he read it over and over and over again all throughout his life. Could you, as a New Testament Christian, could you say the same thing? that you read your Bible all the time from Genesis through Revelation that for years of your adult life for decades now with some of you that you've read the Bible in its entirety many many times that that, that is the number one book that you go to that, it, that in your free time before the television is turned on that you're going to take some time and study the Bible because that's what you do every single day. The righteous man, according to Psalms, it says that his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. Is that you? 
Is that you? Biblical illiteracy statistically in the United States for an entire generation now has been at an all-time low among church goers. I was listening to a podcast just the other day in which the Christian religion was being discussed. And it was not a, a podcast put out by the Church of Christ. It was, there was a Catholic, a Jew, and two Protestants that were discussing the religion of Christianity. And one of the things that they all brought out was that, and they quoted Barna and other sources that said that, yes, biblical literacy is very low and illiteracy is very high. That most people who go to church these days don't know their Bibles hardly at all. And we wonder why the church isn't growing. We wonder why our nation is in the state that it is in, our culture is. We're, we're supposed to be the, the light of the world, the city set on a hill, the salt of the earth. What the Jesus' instrument that makes a difference in the lives of the lost and brings them to him. And so many of us hardly know this book. Has God written his laws on your mind and in your heart? The psalmist said, Psalm 119, verse, 1, verse 11, your word I have stored up in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Store up. You know what comes to my mind when I, when I hear that word? Store up. Five years ago, right before I moved here, we, were, we, we spent about seven months before, uh, before Calhoun brought me here. And so we were, and we were living with friends because we didn't have a house to stay in. So a lot of my stuff, a lot of Beth's stuff, the girls' stuff, had to be put into storage, U-Haul, those U-Haul storage bins. You take all of our stuff and you, and you stack it up and just keep making stacks till you fill up both of those storage bins where there's not, there's not a, an inch of space left because from floor to ceiling you just stocked it up with boxes. Can we say that about God's word being in our mind and in our heart? that we have stored it up, that we have filled the attic, the storage space of our brains, of our hearts from floor to ceiling with the will of God that's revealed in the Bible. Can we say that? Many of us can't. And it's a travesty. And it should not be that way. The New Testament was designed by God so that his people in the New Testament Christians would know their Bibles and by knowing their Bibles they would live by their Bibles and the next difference in the passage makes this very clear too if you go back to Hebrews chapter 8 and we keep reading how he describes this new covenant he says in verse 11, And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. Again, here's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament was a covenant between God and just the nation of Israel. And it was designed so that if you, had, if you were Jewish parents and you had a Jewish baby, son or daughter, it was just by virtue of you being a Jew, you were already part of the covenant that God had between you and Israel. In fact, if you were a male Jewish baby, then Genesis 17, God told Abraham, uh, every male child of your descendants on the, eight, on the eighth day after their birth, they shall be physically circumcised. And that that circumcision was a sign of the covenant between me and your descendants, Abraham. In other words, the physical circumcision was a sign that right from the very beginning of their lives, the second that they were born, they were already part of the covenant that God made with Israel. And so 
being automatically right at birth part of the covenant, well, do babies know anything? No, they, they have to be taught. They have to be taught everything as they grow, don't they? And so they're part of a covenant with the Lord, but they don't know the Lord. They don't know the Lord. They have to be taught everything about God as a child, and so they are. But you see, there, there's a difference between that and the new covenant of Christianity because you're not, under the new covenant, you're not born a Christian physically. No, you go through, you, you are born and you go throughout your formative years and you reach an age where you become accountable. You know the difference between right and wrong and you choose wrong as we all do and so you are you have sinned, you have fallen short of the glory of God, you are in need of a Savior, you need the good news of Jesus, the gospel. And so what are, what are we as Christians who we're supposed to know our Bibles? We're supposed to have the laws of God written on our minds and on our hearts. What are we supposed to do? We are supposed to go to you because you are a lost soul due to your sin in need of a Savior. We're supposed to go to you and we're supposed to teach you. We're supposed to teach you about God about the good news of Jesus. We're supposed to teach you about who Jesus is and what he has done for you and prompt you and motivate you and encourage you to believe in that message with all of your heart and then teach you also as a result of believing that you should repent of your sins. We are to teach you basically what sin is, why you should repent of it, and what that means. And we teach you about baptism and the benefits of how baptism washes your sins away and how baptism is that spiritual circumcision, as Romans 2 and Colossians chapter 2 brings out. And it's through baptism that that's when you, the, the new covenant, that you become a part of it. You come up out of that water and you're a Christian. And being part of a new, the new covenant, when, that, when you have joined the covenant, the new one, when you come up out of baptism. Do you have much that you still need to learn about God? Of course you do. That's why Jesus said, after baptism, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you in Matthew 28. But when you enter into the covenant, you already know about God. You already know him to a degree because it was designed that way that you be taught and that you be converted and then you're taught some more. So the Old Testament, every man would say to his brother, hey, you need to know the Lord. Why? Because they were part of the covenant before they even came to know the Lord. They were part of the covenant at birth. But in the new covenant, he says, they shall all know me. They won't have to say to each other, hey, you need to find out about God because they already do know me that's how they came to be part of the covenant in the first place when they were taught the gospel the New Testament was designed for evangelism the New Testament was designed to teach others about God so that they can be part of the new covenant so the question I have for all of us again is are we fulfilling our responsibilities that the new covenant has given upon us to teach the lost about God, to teach the lost about Jesus? There are so many opportunities that every one of you has every single day do you know someone, a, a family member or a friend or a co-worker, someone, that, uh, just, someone that, that all you know them on is maybe just through social media? Maybe they're talking about some sort of difficulty in their life. They're having a hard time. Maybe, they're, maybe their marriage is going through some problems or they have some stress involving their children or their job or they're just worried about the, the way that our the, the direction that our culture or our country is headed in. And what, what happens when you're at work with them? You know, they're talking to you. They, just, they do what all of us do. They share the stresses and concerns of life, don't they? 
You have an opportunity every single time someone does that with you. When you just start off the, the conversation, so how's it going? And if someone says to you, well, it's just not doing too good these days. Got a lot going on. Oh, well, tell me about it. And they tell you about it. You have an opportunity right then and there, an open door for you to bring Jesus into their life. Yeah, hey, man, I get it. I get it. You know what? I, my marriage, I've had struggles in my marriage, you know. Now, and kind of the same thing of what you're going on. But you know what really helped my marriage? You know what really made me a better husband or a better wife? It was Jesus. And in fact, let me tell you something. Where I go to church at the Calhoun Church of Christ, I remember last year, the preacher, he preached a whole series of, of lessons on marriage, and it really, really helped me. They're on YouTube, you know. Here, you got your phone? Let me share with you the link. Let me show you. Watch, you watch this and tell me what you think. And then follow up on that. Wait a couple of days. Hey, did you watch that? Oh, yeah. Hey, you know what? You ought to come to church with me. You ought to come to church with me because guess what? He's preaching something else that I think that you would really benefit from. Why don't you come to church with me? Or at the very least, if, if not an invitation. Hey, you know what? I was studying my Bible the other day. And it reminded me of that conversation that you and I had about that problem going on in your life. This verse really helped me when I had that similar problem. I just wanted to share it with you. There are doors of opportunity to bring the gospel to people, to teach people to know the Lord so that they can be converted and become part of this new covenant and part of the kingdom of God. There are opportunities every day for every one of us in this room are we taking advantage of them? Do we even have the mindset, the, the perspective of looking at our relationships with each other, with the lost, in this way? The only way we will, we will even be motivated to do that is if God has written his laws on our minds and on our hearts. In other words, if we every day and every night take time to read our Bibles and to broaden our horizons of knowledge. Not just read the part of the Bible that you already know, but expand. Read the parts of the Bible that you don't know. Read the entire Bible and then reread it and then reread it. Keep doing it because that changes your perspective. Suddenly you begin looking at the people in your life who are not Christians and you see them as what they are before they are anything else, which is lost souls who need a Savior. And the reason you have that perspective is because every day your mind, your heart, your life is centered on the Word of God because you keep reading it and rereading it and rereading it and studying it. And when you have that perspective, where everyone that you see is a soul who is in need of Jesus. And you, and you have the perspective of you can help them. You can share the good news with them. And you want to share the good news with them. And then, that, then guess what? You will. You will. And the people that are in your life, guess what they're going to be looking at you as? A Christian. Someone, and not just a Christian who just goes to church. No, a real believing, he takes it seriously, Christian. And with some of them, yeah, with some of them, yeah, they're not going to want to have anything to do with you anymore because they're not interested in what is good and right and proper. But with some of them, some of them, they're going to be attracted to that. They're, they're going to respect you more. They're going to want to be like that. And you can have those conversations to bring them to Jesus. The New Testament is designed to bring about all of these things. But it depends on you. It depends on you. I got, I, you you'll notice we just got the, we got the sign out front fixed. He did not 
say in the Bible, go into all the world and make really cool signs that have the church website on them, and that's how you share the good news with them. No, what he said was, you go into all the world and you, you proclaim the gospel to them. You want this church to grow? That's how it's going to happen. That's the only way it's going to happen. You want to make a difference in the lives of everyone you know? This is how it happens. When every one of us recognizes that we are saved for one purpose, and that is to save others. That's why. That's why we're saved. How selfish would it be how self-centered would it be for us to basically want the glory of heaven and the peace of heaven only for ourselves? I am so glad that whoever taught me the gospel taught me. Whoever shared Jesus with me shared him with me because now I'm not going to heaven anymore now I'm going or now I'm not going to hell anymore now I'm going to heaven and I'm so thankful for that and that's that's where you stop no it can't be just that it has to be I'm so grateful and so glad that I'm going to heaven and I want you to come too and I want you to go too I want everyone I know to come you know what God wants, you know how God wants Christians to be? Do you remember the famous Oprah Winfrey episode where she tells everyone in the audience to reach under their, their chairs and there's a little box there, they open up a box, and what is it? It's, it's the keys to a new car. And you remember, you, you remember her on the stage and she's like, you get a new car and you get a new car and you all get a new car. You remember that? That's how God wants us to be with the gospel. That's how God wants us to be with salvation. He wants us to be going to everyone and saying, you can be saved, and you can be saved, and you all can be saved, and here's how it happens. Is that you and me? That's how we should be. And if we are going to make a difference in people's lives, and if we are going to improve our own lives, that's how it has to be. The last thing he says is, I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. That is you and me, and it can be others as well. And we need to share with them that good news. If you are here and you need to respond to his invitation and become a part of this new covenant, if you do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then make the decision to repent of your sins and wash them away in baptism. I, I and many others here will be willing to study with you about that. If you're willing to make that commitment, then today is the day to do so. And if, as a Christian, what I've been saying to you today has touched your heart and you realize that I haven't been living up to my responsibilities as a Christian, then the beauty of Christianity is that God is always willing to forgive as long as we repent and start doing what is right. If you need to publicly acknowledge that, then do so as we sing the song. But regardless, if whatever changes you need to make in your life, Christian, acknowledge them before God and make those changes. Won't you come while we stand and sing? Amen.